Joining us now for a talk on data breaches under the South African Protection of Personal Information Act is Ira Gunning, Executive Banking and Finance at ENS Africa. Data breaches around Popia. Ira Gunning, Executive Banking and Finance, ENS Africa. Thanks so much for the opportunity to discuss one of my favorite topics with you today, data protection and privacy. And unfortunately, data protection and privacy go hand in hand with data breaches. And we've seen quite a few of these data breaches, especially with a remote working situation we have in South Africa and globally. We've of course seen the attack against Transnet. We've seen the recent attack against our Department of Justice. And of course, our information regulator systems are hosted by on the same systems as the Department of Justice. So they also suffered from this ransomware attack and had to give notice of this breach to data subjects. So let me start off by discussing the regulatory landscape. About 16 years ago, we saw a piece of legislation, the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act being promulgated. And this act basically gives effect to data messages and online transactions. So it says, for example, if you enter into an agreement online, it is binding. If you use an electronic signature, it is the same as a wet signature. But in sections 85 onwards, it also criminalizes cyber attacks, such as hacking, computerized forgery, and so on. These provisions in ECTA are in due course going to be replaced by our Cyber Crimes Act. Our Cyber Crimes Act became a law in May this year, so 16 years after ECTA, but it hasn't kicked in yet. It is only going to kick in on a date to be gazetted by our president. And when it kicks in, it's going to create a whole lot of new cyber crimes. And it is also going to place a duty on certain providers, such as financial institutions, to report certain cyber crimes to our, our police within 72 hours. And if they don't report those cyber crimes, they can be fined to the tune of 50 million rand. And then we've got the Protection of Personal Information Act, POPI. Some people call it POPI, some people call it Papaya. It's all the same act. This is our act that protects our privacy, our Data Protection Act. It is based on the EU directive, and it is very similar to the general data protection regulation in the EU. Now, what Poppy does is it protects the processing of our personal information, which is entered into a record, and as a general rule, this must be happening in South Africa. So Poppy has got some extraterritorial effect, and it even applies to companies outside South Africa that process personal information in South Africa. Now, when Poppy applies, we have to comply with eight conditions of lawful processing set out in Chapter 3 in the Act. Now, in a nutshell, you have to have a lawful purpose for processing somebody's information. And surely something like hacking or ransomware attack wouldn't be a lawful purpose. Once you've got your lawful purpose, you must only collect as little information to fulfill that purpose. You can only keep your information for as long as you're authorized to keep that information. Anything that you do with that information after you collected it must be similar enough to the reason why you collected it. We must tell our data subjects why we are processing their personal information and give them certain rights, such as the right to be forgotten, and we must keep the information up to date. But as far as cyber crimes and cyber attacks are concerned, Condition 7 would be the most important. And Condition 7 says all responsible parties overseas, they call these entities 
data controllers, entities that decide on the purpose, the why to collect information and how to collect information. Now, responsible parties must implement reasonable, technical and organizational measures to make sure that the data in their possession is secure. Technical is the IT stuff, organizational is the common sense measures. Like if you're working remotely, don't let sensitive documents lie around, lock it away, keep it safe, um, change your passwords regularly and so on. Now responsible parties must do a risk assessment. They must identify the risks to data and then tweak and design these security measures to mitigate those risks. And if they identify new risks, for example, after a cyber attack, they need to fine tune these measures to protect their data. Incredibly importantly, if there is a security compromise or a data breach, then the responsible parties must tell our information regulator, who I've mentioned also recently suffered a data breach and the affected to data subjects. Now, what is a data breach? A data breach is access to or an unauthorized disclosure of personal information to an unauthorized person. So if somebody gets hold of data, or was not supposed to be getting hold of this personal information, then that is seen as a data breach. Interestingly enough, in terms of Poppy, every single data breach must be reported under the likes of the GDPR in the EU, you only have to report a data breach if there is a likelihood that it can cause substantial harm to human beings. We don't have that threshold and our act protects data of human beings and of juristic persons such as companies. And just to end off with a few interesting stats in our remote working conditions, um, we see cyber attacks every 11 seconds. South Africa is facing at least about 600 cyber attacks or attempted cyber attacks per hour. 90% of these are caused by human error, such as not training your um, and, and not changing your password often enough or responding to phishing emails. Malicious emails have increased by 600%. 37% of companies have experienced a ransomware attack. And the average downtime after a ransomware attack for a company is 21 days. So if there's anything to take home from what I've said, please do training and awareness so that we can lessen the data compromises as we've seen 90% of them are caused by human um, error. And it's incredibly important for companies to have an incidence response plan to know what to do if, if a data breach is incurred. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Eric Gunning, Executive Banking and Finance, ENS Africa, for that insightful talk on data breaches under the South African Protection of Personal Information Act. This is very relevant to our next and final panel discussion for the day on the topic confidential computing and cybersecurity. Data privacy and confidential computing have become more urgent talking points during the pandemic. The idea of confidential computing is to encrypt and protect the entire computing process, not just the data, creating additional layers of security around sensitive information. And of course, cybersecurity has become even more relevant as hackers have exploited the coronavirus pandemic to attack businesses worldwide. As one of our prior panelists pointed out, even the cyber criminals are having to work from home. And we've seen a 238% rise in attacks on banks and a 600% increase in attacks on cloud servers between January and April 2020 alone. With fewer employees working on site on the company's secure network, it's imperative that companies shore up their networks and upgrade their cybersecurity strategies and then expand them to home networks, mobile, 
and work from home devices. Of course, AI and machine learning will be as important in hacking activities as in defense against those activities as cyber attacks are becoming more sophisticated and are requiring more sophisticated tools and algorithms to identify. So let's meet our panelists for today's discussion. Ignis de Villiers, Group Head of Cybersecurity, Liquid Intelligent Technologies. Colin Erasmus, Modern Workplace and Security Business Group Lead, Microsoft South Africa. Sheldon Hand, IBM Director for Data and AI, Automation and Security, Southern Africa. And the moderator is Dan Atkins, Group CEO, Transnational Academic Group. Thank you to all of my panelists for taking time out of your busy day to share your insights and experience with us. I'd like to thank Igneous de Villers, Group Head Cybersecurity, Liquid Intelligent Technologies, Colin Erasmus, Modern Workplace and Security Business Group Lead, Microsoft South Africa, and Sheldon Hand, IBM Leader for Data and AI Automation and Security, South Africa. I appreciate all of you taking the time today. So let's go ahead and get started. And Sheldon, if I could start with you. There are many different types of cyber attacks going on in the world, but one of the biggest risks to companies is data breaches, as our previous interviewee just talked about. Why are these risks so significant? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, look, there's a lot of... Um financial motivation behind the data breaches. A lot of this information or data can be monetized for, for, for commercial gain. And that's really what's, what's driving these large scale data breaches. The more, the more records that can be traded, the more money that can be made. In some instances, the, the data isn't easily exfiltrated out of the organization. So we've seen a spin on this, which is ransomware, where the information still remains on site, but it's captured and, and the, the organization is unable to access their own information unless they pay a ransom. So it's largely uh, financially motivated. Excellent. Um, Sheldon, just to follow on from that, we definitely see ransomware and holding data for extortion, but what about people who are taking data and then using it, for example, to expose acts of government or things like this, like we've seen with uh, WikiLeaks and uh, Snowden and things of that nature? Yes, so, you know, we, we call this, I, I suppose we've heard various terms like hacktivism, which is, you know, activists, you know, using this as a, as a means to get across a, a message. And it's a very powerful means. I mean, in some instances, business can be crippled unless they, you know, you know provide some sort of, I don't know, you know, uh, financial, you know, payment or, or something, a change in behavior. So we are, we are seeing, we are seeing, we are seeing quite a, quite a lot of that. Yes. Thank you so much, Sheldon. I appreciate that. Uh, Colin, I'd like to jump over to you. There's been a lot of focus in the news about hacking by various international groups, um, often pointing to Eastern Europe and Asia. But there's another risk, and that is from insiders that might be worse. Why is the insider risk so great? Daniel, thank you very much. And I, I think this is something that has emerged um, over the last couple of years very specifically. And I think you, you potentially see two types of insider risk. Um, that that is malicious, where people are deliberately or employees are deliberately doing it. And then in many instances, and I think in most cases, um, negligence, people just don't know that they are potentially exposing their employers. And then as some of the previous panelists have, have said, that does create a massive potential fi uh, um, financial risk, um, potential reputational da damage for the organization. Um, and I think we need to, and we may get into this discussion a bit later, we also need to look at how 
organizations should uh, should protect against things like this. And one of the first things, Daniel, is to understand what data you have. Um, you know, that is really where it all starts. And it's very sad in some instances, if you have a look at some of the stats, a lot of people just aren't aware of the types of data that they have, where their data sits. We talk about cloud, you know, that data could be sitting on prem in different cloud environments. Um, and then to actually be very very cognizant of the policies and the training that we need to give people and individuals to make sure that they become part of the solution and not part of the problem. Excellent. Yeah, I've heard a lot about people inadvertently creating cyber breaches within their company, as some of our previous panelists talking about cloud computing uh, referred to, like just picking up a USB drive, thinking, let me find out whose it is plugging it into their computer and infecting the network in that way. Uh, Ignis, you know, some businesses are outsourcing their computing to cloud providers or managed services companies as a solution. Is this really a solution to cybersecurity concerns or is it just presenting a different set of risk that have to be considered? Um. Hi, Dan, and good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so certainly, uh, you know, uh, there will always be a risk, you know, whether it's done, uh, security is handled internally or whether it's uh, provided by service providers. What I do think is very, very important is uh, to have a clear roles and a responsibility, uh, 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 you know, matrix, which indicates who's responsible for what when uh, out uh, you know when uh, security services are outsourced specifically it's if it's cloud related services to uh, to make clear distinction between what the, the the company themselves are responsible for and on the other hand what uh, you know the, um, the service providers are responsible for, uh, for. And, uh, and that sort of differ is different depending on the type of cloud services an example that's consumed uh, infrastructure is service uh, versus a platform as a service or a, a software as a service and, and and very very important for for consumers or for, for uh, companies to be sure as to what their responsibility is and and, and what the responsibilities of those entities uh, are that that's providing the services um, uh, uh, important in that is most of the uh, cloud providers are in a position to utilize uh, or to enable security uh, features that comes uh, as part and partial of uh, the, uh, the, the services that are consumed. Uh, but uh, in many instances, uh, customers uh, opt not to, uh, uh, not to go for uh, the, the security that's required. So it's important for customers also to ensure that they're aware as to what their risks are and what needs to be enabled specifically related to the own landscape. Thinking about a recent cybersecurity issue that happened with Amazon Web Services, where an insider who had access to decryption keys went and took a significant amount of data, hundreds of gigabytes of data from various customers. Does moving to the cloud simply create a order of magnitude or several order of magnitude larger insider threat? Because now you're dealing with everybody who works for that cloud provider? Yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly that risk. And I think that's why initiatives like the cloud, uh, uh, a confidential computing uh, you know, initiative is certainly you know, addressing uh, that risk. Uh, uh, the same would apply, you know, internally within an organization. If there's an internal entity uh, that's got malicious intent, you know, the same could happen. But uh, but certainly, uh, you know, if if somebody at a service provider has the intent to to uh, you know. Um, uh, or malicious intent, they, uh, they would certainly be in a position to do so, uh, where they have, uh, especially if they have pre elevated privileges, uh, which enable them to also see the data, uh, data 
data that's related to the customers and not only uh, you know what they should be seeing uh, and then it's from that perspective that i think that confidential computing is really uh, making strides in the right direction really appreciate that um sheldon if i could come back to are you, you able to hear me? Uh, yes we're able to hear you uh, sheldon if i could come back to you what can companies do to increase the confidentiality of their data so that they can mitigate the risk from data breaches. So, so thank you, Dan. Um, I think the, the, the clear and obvious one is to encrypt the data. So, um, you know, as, as Colin was saying, you know, it's very important for clients to actually understand what data they've got, you know, what's the value of that data and, you know, have a policy in place which says, certain types of data, which is high value data to the organization or very sensitive data should be encrypted. And there's different ways to encrypt the data, but I think that's, that's probably, you know, one of the, the easiest ways is clearly under identify your sensitive data and encrypt it. And there's a variety of different ways to encrypt it, whether it's at rest, in flight, in motion, et cetera. Appreciate that, Sheldon. So Colin, let me jump over to you from uh, Sheldon's comments. You know, companies can identify their data, they can encrypt it, but that takes effort, that costs money. Now we are seeing governments push on companies with things like the GDPR or the POPIA that we just heard about. What can regulators do to improve cybersecurity and the confidentiality of digital information? Uh, Dan, I, I go back to Sheldon's point just for one second, because I think uh, to answer that question, uh, what Sheldon mentioned was absolutely critical. Um, we need to identify the data that we have within our organizations, and we need to classify it, because like Sheldon said, and like you said, it can get expensive. So we need to make sure that we identify the data. We don't want to take a piece of information that is publicly available, potentially, and encrypt it. Uh, that may not be necessary, but we may want to take something like source code that we have as an organization or people's ID numbers or healthcare records and encrypt that potentially because that can be very valuable information and may be a, a, a source of attack uh, potentially. So that's those are the first two things that are very important for me is, is classifying that data, making sure that we're protecting that data in the right way. The, the next step for me is this data loss step which is exactly what you spoke about. What, what can we do? What can organizations do um, to help against data loss, be it malicious or be it, uh, be it unintentionally? And then the, the last bit for me is the governance of that data. How do we then look at also from a regulatory point of view is how do we then go and, and look at the governance of the data? But to maybe answer the question, and I think regu regular, regulatory bodies around the, around the globe um, in South Africa, um, organizations themselves, I, I think there's a lot of work that we can be doing around skilling. Um, we've had a lot of this conversation over the last while as an industry, um, security skills um, are sorely needed uh, globally and in South Africa as well, both from a technical point of view, as well as from a cultural point of view. Um, I mentioned this a little bit early on, but I think within the country, within our own organizations, there's a lot that we can be doing to skill individuals around the cultural aspects of security and becoming part of the solution. And, and, and just there maybe as a last comment to, to spur further discussion potentially is the one thing that is starting to take off globally is this concept of zero trust. Because I do think that it's also an important concept when we look at you know verifying explicitly the, the question that that uh, that we spoke about earlier on you know how do we make sure that admins don't have privileges that they potentially shouldn't have out of the time that they should have so we want to verify explicitly um, we want to make sure that we're only giving access to what is really needed at the time and we always want to work under the uh, assumption that we have a breach um, and I think these are some interesting concepts in the cybersecurity world that are starting to take hold. Well, Colin, since you brought that up, and we definitely want to go into that topic, can you explain in a way that non-technical people will be able to understand, what does zero trust mean, and what kind of impact might it have that they would see or from their perspective? So I, th I think what it means is when we, and, I, and I'm going to deal with the three pillars and, 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 and try and speak about it not, not in a, in a non-technical uh, way, but you know, when we talk about verifying explicitly, really what we are saying is it starts with your identity. 
So as you get access to something, you know, in your own organization, you may get pop, you may get a pop-up that is verifying you as an individual. So are you Colin Erasmus? Provide me with a password or maybe provide me with a biometric. So I know it's you that's trying to access this. The second part of that is gaining access to only what you need. So if you think about having a fairly large set of data, uh, individuals may not need access to that large set of data. They may only need access to three or four points within that data set. So that's what we mean by giving people access to only what they need. And then the last one is assuming a breach. This is really the world that we're living in now. Cybersecurity has changed. Attacks have, be, attacks have become a lot more sophisticated, um, um, a, a lot more prevalent. We, we heard about the, the increase of attacks. So we're now living under that environment and you as an individual should also be thinking that way, uh, assuming that you, that you are potentially going to be attacked or, you, or that you have been breached and how do you protect yourself in that environment? So that is really the three major pillars. We've seen organizations apply them slight, slightly differently. They may not call it zero trust, but this is really the principle that is starting to guide a lot of the cybersecurity landscape. Thank you so much, Colin. I think you did a great job of making that understandable for people who didn't necessarily grow up with a focus on IT. That was wonderful. Uh, Ignis, we've been going through this pandemic for nearly two years now. We've had a lot of discussion today about the work from home model. How has work from home and even before that, the idea of bring your own device increased the challenge companies face in cybersecurity? Um. I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, with the pandem pandemic, uh, companies were forced to, to enable, uh, to enable uh, you know, the necessary protection measures, which they previously didn't necessarily do. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, from that perspective, uh, you know, I think some companies uh, were in a position where they've had uh, sufficient protection measures, uh, whereas others haven't had that. And, and they found them in, to be in a very difficult scenario uh, where the workforce had to work from home. Some of them had difficulty getting that right, being able to work securely uh, securely from home and then also others uh, uh, you know have been compromised because of that and i think that what is important there we previously you know when people were working at the office most of the security controls that protected the user uh, 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 users or uh, the, the the company staff was sort of uh, uh, on site on on premise you know there were some perimeter controls if they access uh, a website uh, through the web browser it's protected by web content folder and all of those features were enabled with, by what they've implemented on their own perimeter what changed now is that that perimeter now became where the user is and 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 the emphasis on what protection needs to be put in place changed from what was uh, previously at the perimeter and now became a very much linked to the individual or the, the the user himself and 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 the device that they are utilizing and hence the protection measures that's implemented also had to move and and and, and because of that there's obviously a number of evolving technologies that came to before a good example would be secure uh, access service edge uh, we you know uh, the new uh, that as a, 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 as a, a solution enables uh, uh, users to still access their private information within their private networks in a secure manner but also protects them when they access public uh, uh, public applications or cloud applications by uh, facilitating secure access secure um, uh, facilitating two-factor authentication facilitating web filtering uh, data leakage and a number of other components that that sort of moved the, the uh, you know moved the security from the external perimeter of an organization's private network to the input thank you so much for that just as a, a follow-on if people are using their own devices does this even increase further the concept that Colin was talking about of assuming a breach. It's very likely that individuals with their own consumer devices may have some sort of malware on them. 
how does the company deal with that when people are bringing their own devices or using their own devices at home and connecting to company resources? Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, a, a number of the solutions that are available to uh, today does uh, provide for uh, for profiling, which uh, which means in the end, you know, um, uh, it looks at whether the user of uh, first of all known. And, and, and can be trusted. And then secondly, whether the, the device is a managed device, meaning uh, it's managed by the organization or not. And depending on that, the, the, you know, uh, less privileges or less, uh, they won't be as authorized as they would normally be if they have a, a managed device, a managed user and, and a known user, you know, it's dealt with differently. They are contained and it comes back to the zero trust uh, principle where they limited in what they can execute. There are also, uh, you know, uh, alternative solutions where they, uh, when you connect to an environment and your device is not trusted, that you then provide it with a virtual instance, which limits and contain what you can do and also what you can execute. And because of that, you know, you can still have uh, that connection and in the access and secure access to what you need to have. That's great, Ignis. I really appreciate that. I want to go to Sheldon. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about encrypting data and protecting it in various ways, and you threw some terms out there. Most non-technical people are used to seeing the padlock up in the corner of their browser. Some of them even know that's attached to a secure socket layer or SSL certificate and it protects data in transit across the web. But what can be done about securing data at rest or even more importantly, securing data in use? So data that's already been decrypted so that an end user can use it. Yeah, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> before, I, before I get to that question, I'd like to maybe just circle back on the remote work uh, and, and it leads on to this question. Um, one of the statistics that we saw around remote work is that it increased a company's ability to detect and respond to breaches. It increased that time by 58 days, okay? We also saw that the cost to contain it, well, the, the cost of a data breach increased 10% during the course of the pandemic. So, you know, there are two data points in, in research done, which really showed the impact of remote work. Um, coming back to, coming back to your, your question, right, um, around data, data at rest and, and, and data in motion. So the first thing, you know, from, a, from an encryption point of view, you, you, you want to identify your sensitive information. You definitely don't want to encrypt everything because encryption incurs a cost. It incurs a, a, an overhead on the system to, decrypt, to encrypt and decrypt the data. So you don't want to be encrypting everything. You want to make sure, though, that the way in which the data is encrypted is policy-based, right? So you have a system in place which decides, you know, based on the type of data, whether or not it gets encrypt encrypted. And those policies may change over time because, you know, the value of data uh, changes throughout its life cycle for an organization. So information, you know, depending on your business, as an example, if you're a telco operator, your, your, your data today, your call data records is very important to your business from a billing perspective, because, you know, that's what you're going to be charging your customers. But, you know, those same records two years from two years from now may not be that valuable. So maybe right now you may want to encrypt the data, but in two years time, you may not want to encrypt the data. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is you really want to make sure that the encryption technology that you use is transparent to the user experience, right? So the user, you shouldn't change the user experience or the user behavior. The user should go and access their information like they've always done. Uh, it should be transparent to them. They access the information. They go about doing their business as, they, as, they, as they've always done. And I think that's really, really important. Data, data in motion 
pollution is, is quite one and it's not an easy problem to solve, but this is also where you have to profile the content of the data. And as the data is moving throughout the organization, whether moving internally within the organization, or that data now is going to leave the organization through email or through a, through a web channel, you may then want to apply certain encryption capability on that data based on the content of that data in flight. But once again, what's really, really important is that you want to absolutely minimize the use, you want to mask all of this from the user experience. There should be no impact to the user experience because many of these organizations have thousands of employees and you don't want to put in a security technology that impacts 10 or 15,000 employees and you know, start to contact the help desk because their user experience has changed. Yeah, absolutely. The people at the help desk would not appreciate that. And certainly in that case, the prevention could be worse than the disease if you actually are causing economic loss to the company because it's impacting the users being able to do their job. Very insightful, Sheldon. I really appreciate that. Colin, I wanted to come to you as a representative of Microsoft or someone who works for Microsoft. Um, you're working with the company that has the dominant operating system on personal computers, laptops, um, the devices most of us work with and get our jobs done with every single day. What kind of things has Microsoft been doing to secure the computing experience, secure the data that's on there, and to really make it a much safer environment, both for individuals and corporates? Uh, Daniel, I think that's a, a very good question because we've been speaking about things like patch management um, for a long time. I mean, ever, ever since I've been at Microsoft and been in the security world, and we often see that these, uh, these are sometimes the sorts of things that are potentially used is, is unprotected systems um, for bad actors to get into organizations. Um, and the other thing I think we do need to understand, and we've had a long conversation about this, is that the cybersecurity landscape has dramatically changed for us over the last three to four years. Um, you know, we spoke about that the perimeters are no longer the perimeters that we that that we knew, right? Um, we we even now have new definitions of employees, as an example. Um, you know, if we have a look at bots, you know, is a bot an employee? A bot is, for instance, um, producing data. We need to make sure that we're encrypting and storing that data and be and, and aware of that data. NFC devices, as we're making payments of watches or, or or whatever it may be. So the world has fundamentally changed for us. And Sheldon, I think, spoke very eloquently about it needs to be the technologies that we've thought about and we've brought into the operating systems now are inline technologies with what you do on a daily basis. So we don't want security to become something that hampers productivity. Um, I think that is very critical and that's a lot of the work that we've been doing. AI becomes exceptionally important because you know back in the day, we may have had a couple of individuals behind a screen looking at signals coming in and being able to block ports. That's no longer reality for us. There's just too much going on. Um, and the attacks are evolving hourly, daily, uh, every minute. So we need to make sure that we're employing technologies um, that have AI capabilities that can spot risks as they're going and can then help mitigate um, and solve as we, as we go along. Um, so you know, Microsoft, as an example, has um, something called Security Graph where we are collecting trillions of signals on a daily basis and actually looking through those and actually providing that out to our customers, to the operating systems that you spoke about to say, hey, look out for X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, I always talk about people, process, and technology because I think that is critical in this world. Um, we need to make sure that we've got the right technology in place be it, be it be AI enabled technologies, integrated technologies, but we need to make sure that we are educating our people at the same time, making sure that they understand both from a technical skill point of view, as well as from a cultural technology uh, or cultural perspective and processes. Sheldon mentioned as well, um, very, very critical that we understand the processes and we test things like backups, including things like patch management. If you go to a cloud provider, in some instances, they're doing this for you. Some, In some instances, they may not be doing it. Because of this landscape we've spoken about, we need to make sure that people are doing things like that regular patch management to make sure that they are as safe as they can be. Really appreciate that, Colin. I do remember it was not uh, too long ago when there was a major 
security breach that was due to people having not patched their Windows operating systems, even though Microsoft had to patch out some two months before. So uh, absolutely agree that patch management is hugely important. Uh, Ignis, Kevin Mitnick, the famous hacker, is once reputed to have said that it's much easier to hack people than it is to hack systems. How does social engineering play into the cybersecurity landscape? Uh, it, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly a, a very, very critical aspect of, of cybersecurity. And I think, you know, creating awareness, you know, amongst users are critical in that regard. And, and, and also, uh, you know, it's not only uh, to staff in general, but also to have specific initiatives and campaigns related to, to the roles of different individuals within the company. As an, a good example would be the service desk. You know, um, uh, you would be surprised how many uh, attacks have been successful because of the fact that people have been able uh, to find a good, uh, details of individuals that's working within the company, uh, publicly available, you know, things like uh, the, the names and the surnames and their wife's names and, and, and a number of uh, inf uh, uh, information related to the individual. And then when they engage with the, with the, uh, the service desks and they ask for something to be done, uh, such as, can you please change uh, my passwords and, and impersonating somebody that's working within the company, then the service desk person wouldn't necessarily recognize the, uh, the, the voice of the person and then say, okay, can you give me your uh, wife's uh, surname or and and if you're incorrect in your answer then you know they can always uh, they'll typically ask you a second question and it's highly likely that you get right and if you don't get right you just put the phone down and then you can attempt that the same thing uh, later on so that's uh, that's uh, one angle on that and then there's obviously lots and lots of information or ways whereby social engagement allows you to gain information which uh, which enables you to take the next step which would otherwise not be possible and 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 to me i find amazing sometimes the type of information that's made available by individuals that's utilizing, you know, social media as an example, uh, and even LinkedIn, you know, uh, you, uh, I'm surprised at times to see what's shared, uh, you know, uh, uh, in public, and that enables uh, that uh, opportunity to do social engineering. Absolutely. It is shocking the amount of information that people now freely share that makes it extremely easy for hackers because people don't think about the fact that their security question is their pet's name and then they've got 57 pictures of fluffy on their facebook page so it creates quite a challenge for individuals but quite an easy situation for the hackers we've got about five minutes left so i'd like each of exactly. you as technology experts to pull out your crystal ball. And I'd like to give a minute each to you to say, what do you think is going to be the next big cybersecurity challenge? So Sheldon, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I think that, and I'm not, I'm not looking too forward in the future. I'm kind of thinking about the next two to three years here. But I think the biggest challenge we face is how do we, how do we have a security program across the enterprise that takes care of this dramatically changing landscape where we've got legacy systems, right? And we've got public cloud. And in the middle, we've got hybrid cloud. And so as the organization wants to do digital transformation, because that's a business imperative, the security function within an organization is going to have to, you know, find a way to protect the old, okay, take care of the new, okay, you, with the same amount of resource. I don't see security budgets being increased dramatically. I don't see the number of security professionals being increased dramatically. The number of cybersecurity skills globally continues to be a continues to be a challenge. Many of the security workforce are, are, are burnt out and overwhelmed because of you know, the impact of COVID and the extended work hours. So for me, it's 
you know, this is the, it's the complexity of the evolving, of the evolving organization that is the biggest threat to, 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 I would say, to organizations from a security perspective. How do we manage the old, the legacy as we transition to the new with the same resources? It's a challenge. Thank you so much, Sheldon. Colin, over to you. Daniel, I think the first thing I do need to say is thank you, based on Sheldon, to the chief security officers out there, the chief information security officers. This has been a hell of a job um, over the last 18 months. It really has been incredible, and they've been at the forefront. I believe, if I look at it, um, I believe we're actually now in a security transformation era. Like we had digital transformation, um, like we had cloud transformation, I firmly believe we're now in this security transformation era that is really going to take center stage for the next couple of months, especially as we go back to what may be the new new normal, we we'll call it hybrid work, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's where we are. I think it's just going to become more complex. We're going to have to make sure that we get uh, a lot of individuals skilled. We got to make sure that we get the culture, the security culture uh, inculcated in our children as well. We've spoken about things like people uh, giving freely of themselves and information. We need to start educating at that level that people understand what this means. So I really do believe for us, we're now in a security transformation era. Thanks so much, Colin. I appreciate that. And I echo your sentiment of thanking all of the cybersecurity experts who are keeping us safe day and night. So Ignis, over to you for the last word. Yeah, so from my pers uh, perspective, I think that one of the biggest challenges that organizations is going to have is, is as technologies evolve and, and capabilities to, for hackers to, uh, and, 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 and those with malicious intent increase and, and their capabilities increase because of new technologies and new ways of getting things done quicker. You know, they, they are always in a position to make you uh, to utilize these as part of their attack, attack, uh, attack mechanisms, whereas organizations is not always in a position to, to do it at the same pace. And, and from that perspective, I think that's a, a big threat. Then uh, uh, along with that is obviously that, you know, uh, that uh, the, the different uh, or the people that's responsible for attacks is, is changing all, uh, as well, you know. And we've seen in America recently where the Russians uh, sort of, uh, you know, started attacking uh, them through cybercrime. And, and I think that will also become a significant factor going forward uh, along with that probably also more more and more regulations that organizations need to adhere to and liability penalties related to that but would put it in and that's it from my side thank you so much to ignis de villers group head of Sec uh, cybersecurity liquid intelligent technologies colin erasmus modern workplace and security business group lead for microsoft south africa and Sheldon Hand, IBM leader for data and AI automation and security, Southern Africa. I really appreciate all of your insights in how we can improve our cybersecurity, both individually and as companies, and improve the confidentiality of our digital lives. So as we come to the end of today's proceedings, allow me to call on Sid Wahi, director of the ABN Group, to make his closing remarks. Over to you, Sid. Closing remarks by Sid Wahi, Director, ABN Group. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we bring the Future of Work virtual event series to a close. Thank you so much for being here with us. I hope you enjoyed today's proceedings. I know I certainly did. By way of a quick summary, let me just quickly recap some of the things that we spoke about today. We looked at how infrastructure is acting as a catalyst for growth on the continent. We looked at how physical spaces and geographic boundaries are being shattered and are becoming or may be becoming increasingly less relevant. We also looked at how regulation and privacy is being dealt with. And is regulation a catalyst for growth or is it something that is acting as an impediment and uh, does it lag innovation? Um, I would like to thank all of our speakers and panelists for taking time out and joining us. Thank you to our moderators and uh, finally to our sponsors. Thank you so much, Vodacom Business and Ccom for supporting this initiative. 
from all of us here at CNBC Africa, we wish you an amazing rest of your day. And thank you once again for joining us at the virtual event.